I am so excited to announce that iDriver Classic is now sponsored by Adrian Flux, one of the UK's leading classic car insurers. If you're looking for classic car insurance, I've popped a link to Adrian Flux in the description box below. Hi guys, it's Steph from iDriver Classic and today I'm back in this amazing car from the 1940s, a Rover 12 Tourer, made only in 1947 and 1948. There were only ever 200 of these made and only 37 remain. So it's a really exciting car to take out on the road today. So as always in an iDriver Classic test, we're going to look around the outside, we're going to come inside, look around the inside, under the bonnet and new to iDriver Classic, we're also going to look in the boot as well. Before we take this car and a fantastic little test drive. So let's begin by having a look around the outside and I'll tell you a little bit about the Rover 12 Tourer. Today we're looking at this incredible Rover 12 Tourer from the 1940s and what makes it even more incredible aside from the fact that well it's nearly 80 years old is the fact that the owner drives this every single day even to the tip to drop off rubbish and to the co-op to buy milk and therefore I just had to feature it on iDriver Classic because I got offered it and thought this is a car which definitely deserves a little bit of love. Now depending on the, your age and where your interest in areas of classic cars lie, you'll have a varying perception of Rover. But the Mark founded in 1878 as Rover Company began life as a simple bicycle manufacturer before moving into the world of automotive in 1904. And as Rover established itself as an automotive manufacturer, it was a very different Rover to the watered down, everyday man, middle of the road Rover, which saw the end of the mark in the 1990s. Early Rovers, and probably until about the 70s and 80s, it was kind of the choice of the aspirational middle-class family. And at the time of the Rover 12 P1 coming to market in 1934, Wilkes Brothers were busily establishing the reputation of Rover with the Rover tradition, which was to essentially create a quality, sought-after car, which would be the go-to mark for the well-off middle class in the post-depression, pre-Second World War Britain. And with this, Rover introduced, as part of its offering, the Rover 12 P1, which was the car that came before this one. And it was a semi-hand-built car with the ability to easily reach 70 miles per hour, which at the time was a massive thing because we were still in that world of countryside Britain where motorways didn't exist. So that was quite a hefty top speed. So the P1 was given a 1.5 four-cylinder overhead valve engine and the P2, which is what this Rover 12 Tourer is, was added in 1937. And keen to keep building on that success with the P1, they upgraded everything with the P2. So the P2 had a longer wheelbase than the predecessor, a stiffened chassis and girling brakes, which was a massive thing at the time because it replaced the hydraulic units which had been used on the P1. And by the time that the production ended on the P2 in 1948, Rover had produced over 17,000 Rover 12s. And if you think about where that fits in social commentary at the time, owning a car was a massive privilege. And really interestingly, they only ever produced 200 of the Tora variety, like the one we're testing here today. And just to note, of those 17,000 Rover 12s built, 5,775 were the P1. The rest were the P2, as we see here today. Now, one of the reasons that there maybe, maybe weren't as many of these Tourers as there were the saloons is because Rover didn't actually build these Tourers. So, to be very precise, the first four Tourers were built by Rover and the last 196 were built by AP Coach Builders of Coventry. Now, as you'd expect of a car of this age, there were no automatic transmission units and it was only a manual transmission unit on offer, which I am going to demonstrate to you later in the video. Now, it's not a fully blown non-synchro box because the two top gears do have synchro, but that wasn't actually something that was fitted from standard. It came in later on when they went on to the P2. 
And it's also men worth mentioning while we're talking about the Rover 12 that if you found this via searching YouTube and you're not expecting to see this particular Rover 12, it's because this wasn't the first car to carry the Rover 12 badging. That accolade went to the two-cylinder water-cooled car made between 1910 and 1912. And between that point and this point, there were several other cars that carried that Rover 12 name. Now, before we go on to chatting to the owner, I thought I'd mention one of the interesting points about this car, which are the suicide doors, which isn't something you see on modern cars as standard anymore. But at the time, this was a standard thing to see on cars. Now, I was saying that it isn't on all modern cars, but it is on a couple. So I believe it's on the Mazda RX-8, the Mariva, and the entire Rolls-Royce lineup. Now, what I mean by suicide doors is, is the door is hinged in the opposite direction. So it op opens the opposite way to the doors on probably the car that you drive today. And if you're wondering why this was ever used, because it's not exactly in keeping with health and safety, it's because back when horse-drawn carriages were a bit of a thing, that's how the doors opened. And it also weirdly was modeled on French doors anyway. So when it came to early car builders and early car manufacturers creating the first cars, they used these horse carriages as a bit of a blueprint for the early automobiles and it kind of carried on through. And it's also, and again, it's in keeping with the time, it was also put in because it allowed people to exit the car in an elegant way and was ideal for a lady wearing a longer dress to exit the car without any embarrassment. And earlier cars as well didn't have a B pillar, so it gave occupants of the car even more room for entry and exit. So again, just a little bit of trivia for you. Now, I've got so much to show you today because this is a really beautiful and special car and indeed very rare as well. But before we do that, I thought I'd catch up with the owner, Simon, because he's a very interesting man and I wanted to include him in this video. So, over to you, Simon. Hi, I'm Simon Fixter. This is my 1947 Rover 12 Sports Tourer. Uh, the car had been stood for 40 years when I bought it. Um, I've just sorted the engine and just recommissioned it and got it back on the road. It's one of only 200 that were ever built. They made 100 in 1947 and 100 in 1948. Um, there's about 35 in existence worldwide, as far as I know. Um, and it's a nice original old car. Yeah, um, I've been using it daily during lockdown uh, for the school run, runs to the shops, whatever. Um, and so far it's proved 100% reliable. Okay, so we're now inside the car and I was really shocked by how much was on offer inside this car. And I know it wasn't cheap, it was £750 to buy new, where something like your Ford Prefect, if we're comparing it in terms of costs, was around £100, I think. So that's in old money, not in new. So it won't really surprise you that um, being such an expensive car, the first home for this was in Mayfair in London. It's one of the most expensive properties on the Monopoly board as well. Now, going back to what's inside the car, this for me is probably one of the most beautifully made, it almost feels crafted cars we've ever taken out. So I'm going to start over here and I'm going to walk you through. Now, first of all, the most interesting thing for me is not only is there a lot of wood in here, but the wood is hiding a few useful bits and pieces. So first of all, I'm going to pull this out. And as you can see, we've got some tools on display. Now coming up, we've got these, which we're going to come back to, these two dials. Because for those of you that are Hubnut fans, you are going to love the wiper action in this. It is like something that we've never tested before. But first of all, we're going to talk through the dials because we've got a lot on offer. And unlike some of the older cars that we've tested, where they're Smith's clocks, these are Jaeger, as you can see. We've got petrol and oil over here we've got a clock now this clock is fully electric but at the moment it isn't working so you may notice that that isn't working when we're on test then we've got our amp meter the amp meter is just to, to check if the battery is charging or not now once we come into the center here we've got our speedo and that runs from zero to 80. now you might have thought that was ambitious but i've been told that the previous owner did actually manage to get it all the way up there and over here you've got oil pressure and under here, you've got water as well. So there's a lot of controls going on here. Now, I want to show you this as well. This is an original key ring for the car, but I thought it was just a nice touch to show you. And of course, above that, we've got the starter button as well to start the car. And over here, we've got our petrol. So 
you may be wondering what this is all about. Well, it's got two two tanks that it feeds from. It's got main and it's got reserve. So main is what you should be running off, but if you run out of petrol, then you can switch over to reserve and that gives you an extra two gallons to get you to a petrol station. And just down here, we've got our headlight switch as well. So it's S for side lights and H for headlights. Now below that, we've got a picnic table, which is just pull out. And sorry, I'm really nervous pulling this out because this is such a beautiful car, I don't want to damage it. Now I wanted to show you what was going on with the wipers because these are really, really interesting. And it is something you would definitely have to perfect before you set off on your journey. So I'll switch the ignition on so I can show you. Now, you've got the two here. So these are what these two dials are. Now we turn this and we have to bring this onto the screen and we have to, if you see, and that noise you can hear is the motor. And then once we've done that, we bring this one onto the screen and that starts bringing itself around as well. And we park that one and we park that one and that's them off. And here's just a quick gearbox demonstration before we set off. Okay, so let's get this car started up. And it sounds really nice. And remember that this car was made all the way back in the late 40s. And it still, to me, sounds really, really nice. So we'll, of course, we'll tell you what it sounds like inside, and then we'll head through to the back. Remember, with the car of this era, you do need to press the start button. Now let's head to the back. going to go out with something on my head did you so i'm going to put this scarf on because i am not ruining my hair because i've got other cars to test today although it looks pretty ruined already because it's quite windy i'm just going to put the headscarf on i feel like something out of an alfred hitchcock film except less glamorous no did an alfred hitchcock film would have worn crimpling um get that tied on right let's go now that we take it out for a drive, I'm going to do what we do on all our tests recently. We're going to start off in first and we're going to come up through the gearbox. So for note, um, in terms of driving, we've got no synchro mesh on first. Second is really, really tight, even if you're double D clutching into it. Third is pretty good. Um, and then fourth, as you come down, you really need to, quite a positive action. So if you see it bounce back, it's because I've not been forceful enough. So let's set off and I'll be quiet a minute so you can hear how she sounds. And that is us up into fourth successfully. And we've done that quite quickly because we're up into fourth by, by 30 miles an hour even. Now this, I've been driving around a little bit today and I'm sorry about any wind noise. I am doing my very best to try and stop it being so windy. It's a really, really interesting car to drive because I've taken it round the circle a few times to see how it's been. And it's taken a little bit of getting used to, but only because of the gearbox. The brakes on this are on a modern cable system. Now, I didn't really know what to expect from that because it's not something that I've driven before but actually it's no worse off than drum brakes and in fact they're pretty responsive so as we brake there you can feel the car comes to a stop as quick as you'd need it to I wasn't really applying much pressure there steering is pretty responsive so you can see there well I say pretty responsive pretty responsive for the era it's no worse than the Morris Minor and um, it's certainly nothing compared to a modern car I kind of understand how Simon is using this daily because once you get over the fact that your hair is going to look a mess everywhere it's a really, really nice car to drive. And in fact, the build quality on it, which is something that's kind of hard to get across in the video, and the quality of the materials used like this and all the rest of it, 
are a real testament to the fact that the car is still here. It's survived all the way through the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, and all the way through scrappage schemes and when cars like this weren't worth very much money. And it's here with us today and it is such a beautiful car. And I cannot believe that we're out testing it today. As you can probably see, uh, because it's windy, it's really blowing about, but also I'm really struggling to work out where the side of the car is. And I would say that that and the bizarre gearbox that's taken me a little bit to get used to are the only drawbacks to owning something like this. Yes, you can't really get the parts anymore and I know that Simon was saying that when he rebuilt the engine, the push rods just weren't available, not even through the Rover Club. So he basically modified a few bits from some MGB push rods and he got it going like that. And I think that's kind of the thing with some of these old cars is that you will get parts that are just totally not they're not used across different different models for things like you know if you're going to take an a series engine you can take bits from the a series this is its kind of own separate entity it is a real wonder to me that there are still 40 of these left so the other thing for me is as well is like how quickly we can get from zero to 30. um also i feel like cruella in this car the suspension is very smooth it's really gliding along these roads i mean we've been very fortunate today that our test route isn't massively scarred with potholes but even so the roads aren't completely smooth and it's really gliding along so much better than some of the other kind of stuff that we've taken out from the 60s even and Yes, this car was £750 new, and yes, it wasn't really for the common man. You had to have been on a massive whacking great wage at the time to afford it, something like this. And especially as well, something that's worth mentioning is, as we came out of the war, we were on steel shortage in the UK in terms of manufacturers, I think, had to export a massive percentage. I know Morris did, and there were waiting lists for cars at the end of the war. So someone would have really, really have had to have wanted this car. And... I can see why they wanted it and I can see why they waited because this car really is something special. And that's kind of our test drive coming to an end really. It's been a massive privilege to take you out in this car today. It's like nothing I've ever driven before and it's the oldest thing that we've ever featured on iDriver Classic. So thank you very much for watching wherever you are in the world. I really hope you've enjoyed this Rover 12 Tourer. If you've had one yourself, let me know and let me know what you thought of it. But all in all, it's been a quality car and a quality day out. So I hope wherever you are in the world, you're okay and things are going well and we're starting to come out of this weird world that we've been in coronavirus. Now until next time, take care and drive safely.